Okay, well, I want to thank you uh, for showing up. I, I'm going to give you a heads up right now. You're all guinea pigs now for the next 35 minutes, maybe. Um, the, the presentation that I'm giving today is a collaborative effort by members of the Tri-Presbytery Delegation of Iowans that went to the U.S.-Mexico border in Douglas, Arizona back in, in November. And uh, we're trying to create something that we can use not only at our Presbytery meetings, but that we can also uh, use with churches within the three different Presbyteries and hopefully um, have a unified uh, message on, on what <clears throat> on what we're talking about. So anyway, uh, I did, uh, I was part of a 12 member delegation that went to the border back in, in November, as you may have heard me say in church a few weeks ago. Um, I'd like to tell you that I had some kind of a calling to go on the trip, but in reality, it was just my curiosity. Um, I was tired of just watching it on the news and worse yet, watching political commercials talk about, about the border and I wanted to see it for myself. Fortunately, this trip uh, was to uh, Douglas, Arizona, which is in the Tucson sector of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency, which is part of Homeland Security now. Um, the Tucson sector of that agency is the busiest sector in that agency. Just for your edification, it is not the Rio Grande in Texas that is the busiest. That's simply where certain politicians and the media go, in my opinion, my humble opinion, uh, because it's a better photo shoot and it's easier to do and there's lots of noise there. Um, we went to a place that's actually the busiest uh, sector, or part of the busiest sector, uh, to Frontera de Cristo, which It's one of four ministry sites of the Presbyterian Borderlands Ministries. And it's a joint project of both the PCUSA and the Presbyterian Church of Mexico. And Frontera de Cristo has been around since 1984 in Douglas, working at the port of entry there which was one of the first ports of entry um, on the U.S.-Mexico border, and it will be 100 years old soon. And uh, Frontera de Cristo is a part of our mission work that uh, will be celebrating its 40th year uh, this year. Frontera de Cristo is located in Agua Prieta, Mexico and in Douglas, Arizona. So it's south of Tucson, an hour and a half maybe or so, in a nice van. Maybe not quite so nice, but. Uh, here you'll see the, the uh, key staff of Frontera de Cristo, our two PCUSA mission coworkers, Mark Adams and Miriam, Escobar. Uh, Mark migrated uh, from South Carolina uh, to the Mexico border uh, 25 years ago now or so and uh, other than to visit home uh, he has lived on the border ever since. He's married to Miriam Escobar who is uh, Miriam was born in southern, southern Mexico uh, and they been married now for over 20 years. Hoka Gallegos, uh, Hoka, that's, it's pronounced uh, just like the shoe company. Uh, she has been, she, she went to seminary in Mexico at the Mexican uh, seminary for the Presbyterian Church and graduated 21 years ago. Unfortunately, the 
Presbyterian Church in Mexico has not yet got to the point of ordaining women, but I'm happy to report that after 21 years, um, she got a call to a Presbyterian Church in Arizona, and she was ordained as a PCUSA pastor back in December. So it was great to, to meet her. Unfortunately, we didn't get to spend as much time with her as we really wanted to, but this is just a picture of the staff and, and the board of Frontera de Cristo. They're just a wonderful group of, of individuals. The mission of Frontera de Cristo is to build relationships and understanding across borders. So here we are at the wall. For thousands of years, what is now Douglas, Arizona, was home to the Opata people. In the 1500s, the Spanish came and claimed that region for Spain. In 1821, uh, the Mexican War of Independence came to a conclusion, and that region became known as Mexico. And then in 1854, the U.S. purchased that area, and then Arizona became a state in 1912. For the first, or for about 150 years, the people in Agua Prieta, Mexico, and Douglas, Arizona, pretty much had crossed back and forth freely uh, on a daily basis. They, it didn't really matter whether you lived in one on one side of the border and worked on the other, or you lived on one side and shopped on the other, or you went to church on one side or the other. Uh, they did, until about 1994, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, uh, they could pretty much just go back and forth across, across the border. Here's a picture of the wall on the Douglas, on the U.S. side of the border. Uh, you'll know the razor wire on the fence. Keep this picture in mind, what this looks like, because you're gonna see something totally different in just a minute when I show you what it looks like on the Agua Prieta side of the border, right there. It's another picture of the wall. This is from several miles outside of town, looking back to the west. The estimated cost of building a mile of the wall uh, can be as much as $20 million a mile, depending on where along the 2,300 mile stretch of the U.S.-Mexico border to the Gulf just depending on the, on the terrain and whatnot. There are areas where it costs significantly less, but it can cost as much as 20 miles, I mean $20 million a mile. Yes? Who do they actually build the wall? <coughs> those are, those are, it's all done privately. I mean, it's private contractors, just in okay. normal government contractors. Yeah. 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 I forgot to mention, um, if you can, hold questions till we get through this. That's all right. Uh, I forgot to mention that, but because uh, we really don't know exactly how long this is going to take. But anyway, uh, the total cost for the wall is estimated to be forty to seventy million dollars, uh, and the We're annual and the annual maintenance is estimated to be around $150 million a year. So, and, and keep in mind, the wall we're talking about now is, you know, is the new wall that replaces the wall that first started in 1994 under uh, President Bill Clinton. He 
keep those costs in mind as well because we'll come back to that. Okay, so now we're gonna move to the Agua Prieta side of the border, which is where we stayed, by the way, in the Presbyterian Church. We were housed in the Presbyterian Church there. Wonderful people. Every morning we got up and got dressed for the day and went out and some women in the church had uh, prepared a different breakfast every morning of the week for us. We, we became very close friends with those folks. <laughs> and what the folks in Agua Prieta decided was the wall, it was very nice of the U.S. to build this nice wall because it makes for a nice canvas. And for many miles cutting across the city of Agua Prieta where the wall goes, you will see um, these wonderful murals. One morning, as part of our Bible reflection time, we all went down to the street where these go, and uh, we did a, individually, we each took our own uh, prayer walk that morning to see as many of the murals as we could. Oh, here's our mode of transportation for the week. This got us around town on, on both sides uh, of the border. So why are there so many migrants at the U.S. border at the present time? Well, we've got to start by looking at the root causes of migration. The main reason right now for migration from Mexico and Central America to the United States remains a, one of economics. Um, in the 1990s, for example, when the price of coffee beans dropped by like 400%, uh, coffee farmers and coffee farm workers from Southern Mexico needed to find work elsewhere. And many of them came north. <coughs> Uh, in the 18 in the 1980s and up through the 2000s the border patrol primarily was apprehending men uh, from Mexico who were seeking jobs and then in the last decade it it turned more towards where uh, you have large numbers of women uh, and unaccompanied minors that are looking to get out of countries and places in Central and South America to get away from violence and to seek asylum. So we have, you know, the economic issues, the poverty that, that they experience, and the violence that are at the root cause of migration. And the last one is just that you now have so many families that are divided, where part of the family may have come to the U.S. some time ago, and the rest had remained in, in Mexico, and they want to be together. <coughs> so what's the cost of migration? Well, today it's about anywhere from $8,000 to $20,000 that people pay coyotes. These are not the animal. Uh, coyotes are the, are the people that lead you through the desert um, <clears throat> to the border and hopefully, supposedly, across the border. Now, many of these people pay this and the coyote doesn't necessarily follow through and they have their money though. While we were there, we met with a variety of different groups that I'll talk about. Uh, many of them are um, church organizations or other types of nonprofit organizations that are providing some kind of support and ministry uh, at the border. We had the privilege of spending some time with um, Officer Tim Brownrigg from the U.S. Border Patrol uh, in a nice sort of park gazebo 
uh, just on the north side, on the U.S. side of the border. And he's been in the, he's been part of the Border Patrol for about 20 years. Um, very open, answers any question that you ask him. Sometimes he answers questions before you ask him. Um, at the present time, what, what's happening now is that a number of the migrants, a substantial number of migrants, and I'll talk more about why in a bit, but a substantial number of migrants cross over the border. They can't go through the port of entry uh, because that, that's a long process and they'll just be turned away. So the reason that they go somewhere where they can get around or through um, the wall is because they want to get to the US side and then they, they don't want to just go somewhere. They want to be apprehended. They basically turn themselves, they find the nearest border patrol agent, basically, if they can, and, and turn themselves in because then they can make application to get into the asylum process. Doesn't mean they're gonna be successful, but it means they can at least start that process. They can't do that if they just try to walk through at the port of entry. Um, once they do get in and they're processed, um, they can then be released once they have been processed and they have a court date to return to an asylum court setting, um, then they can be released into the U.S. Generally to another family member that's already in the U.S. or some organization that might be sponsoring them or provide sponsorship. Um, so their intent is really not to enter the U.S. illegally. Uh, their intent, at, attempt is really to get into the asylum process. That's what they're really after. And that's the current situation at the border. As I said, sometimes Officer Brownrigg would actually answer questions before asked. And the information on this slide um, is information that he provided without any of us even asking for the information. 99.5% of the smugglers on the border are actually already U.S. citizens. They're not Mexican or Mexico or from some other place in Central America smugglers. They're already U.S. citizens. Less than 5% of the migrants that are attempting to come across without proper documentation right now, uh, less than 5% of them actually have some kind of a criminal um, history when, they're, when they take a look at that. And he also pointed out that he has never encountered a suspected terrorist at the Douglas Station. That might come as a surprise to some politicians, but I'll try to be good, Nancy, don't worry. Uh, my, my wife often reminds me, please don't do anything or don't say anything that, that your daddy wouldn't have done. My, dad, my daddy is right here, because this is one of many of his crosses during his 40 years in the ministry that, that were left behind to me. Um, Whoops, wrong button, maybe. Okay, so now you heard a lot in the last year or more about Title 42. Um, Title 42 is a portion of our federal law, our federal code that deals with public health and welfare. And when you may recall that the CDC, once the pandemic started, the CDC uh, declared that we were in a public health emergency. And that eventually led to um, statutory authority for the uh, Border Patrol to basically um, keep anyone from entering the United States. 
uh, who was not a U.S. citizen. So they and they didn't have to they didn't have to process them or anything like that. They simply, if they found people, they simply could just take them back to the border and send them back to Mexico or to wherever they came from. Uh, this was a policy that started under the Trump administration. Um, it was then um, continued by the Biden administration until last May, uh, after which the uh, CDC had said that we no longer had a public health emergency because of, of the pandemic. And that's what has changed, that's another thing that has changed what's going on at the border right now as opposed to what was before. The, the border agents, literally, they, they would just pick people up and take them back to the port of entry and send them back into Mexico or on their way wherever they were headed, but not into the U.S. They didn't even have to, to process them. And now they're back into the business of processing and the Border Patrol and Protection Agency is um, understaffed and under-resourced at the moment. So one of the things we did is we, we took a trip out into the desert, about 25 or 30 miles uh, west of Agua Prieta so that we could see what the terrain was like and what the migrants go through as they're going through the desert and getting to the wall. While we were <clears throat> on this trip to the wall, uh, we stopped at what the migrants referred to as the tree of life, to have a time of biblical reflection and prayer and a picnic meal with the agency that was taking us that day to the wall. The tree of life is, I have no idea how big it is. It is humongous. Uh, and it's called that because it provides shade uh, and protection to migrants during summertime when they're trying to go through the desert. Um, we listened to stories while we were there having our meal. We listened to stories about some of the migrants that were from this agency that took us out there, um, one of whom was Sergio, who was, I believe he had been in Portland, Oregon or somewhere for 30 years. He had lived there undocumented and working in the construction field uh, until he was deported. And he's afraid to go back to the US because he's afraid he'll be um, arrested and this time put in jail. The other reason it's the tree of life is this 55 gallon tank of drinking water. Uh, Frontera de, de Cristo and a number of other organizations sponsor this. They make sure that this is always filled with water so that migrants can get something to drink there. So we're heading out into the uh, and fortunately, they drove us not too far from where that tree is. They drove us in, got off the highway and drove us into the desert ways. So ultimately, we, were, we only had to walk maybe the last two miles to actually get uh, to the wall and the border. Um, if you look closely, let me see. Well, yeah, you can see it better. You can see it better than I can. Uh, you, can you can see the wall that we're, that we're headed towards there. And you also get an idea of um, the terrain that, that these people go through. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful area, but it's also very rugged and it's very challenging. Um, there's no easy way to get through the desert to get to the border or to the wall. There's, you know, there's no path. Um, there's no directional signs, um, and there's certainly no quick trip or come and go or whatever to stop and, and get some water and, and have a bathroom stop. And so you can imagine, and the only thing that's out there are bushes and trees, 
And for some reason, they're all bushes and trees that have sticky things and whatnot. And so everything in the desert can actually hurt you. And the terrain is uneven. And you have to stop and think about these people trying to do this, you know, in the dark. Because most of the time they're trying to move at night, not during the day for a variety a variety of reasons. But anyway, so it, it's, and I was amazed. I mean, we, we did have um, one member of our delegation, Sylvia. Sylvia's 85 years old. And she made that walk. Now, of course, she kind of had her own private coyote because one of the one of the members of the the organization that was leading us that day made sure that uh, he followed her and got her to got her to the wall. So eventually, we we made it to the wall. Um, it's thirty feet, but I can tell you that. Our guide, our main guide that day, shimmied up that wall in less than 20 seconds. It's amazing, I mean, by putting his feet, you know, between the different columns and holding on, he was, it took like less than 20 seconds for him to shimmy up that wall. Yeah. Now, I point out, this is me, Every time you see one of these slides, you probably, if you look for that white hat, you'll find me. But anyway, um, this is me, and I'm standing over by an area right over to my right there, which looks like this when you enter the United States illegally. There I am coming, there I am entering the United States illegally. Had the Border Patrol been nearby and picked me up, uh, I would have been subject of a $5,000 fine, which, as I told Nancy on the phone that later that day, that I would have been very happy to pay the $5,000 fine just to show this slide to someone. Mother Nature doesn't care how high you build the wall. Because when the monsoon season comes in the desert, she just creates new arroyos that you can literally, I mean, I, I did stoop down. I didn't walk underneath it, but I stooped down a little bit to get under the wall right there. And so I wouldn't need to shimmy up the wall. I could just go right under. One evening we were we were visiting one of the uh, organizations that Frontera de Cristo works with called the, and it's the Migrant Assistance Center. And this is where recently deported migrants can come and get some assistance um, while they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do next. And we had dinner with uh, several of them that evening and we heard their stories. Um, I'm not going to go through all of their stories, but I'll tell you a little bit about the, the individual that was at my table that evening. He had um, he had been with a group. Bento had been with a group. He had paid eight thousand uh, dollars to a coyote to get him to the U.S. and when he got to the top of the wall, he fell off. And he he broke his shoulder, his hip, and his ankle. And I'll shorten the story up, but I mean, he, uh, there was no way he could go on. Someone came along that actually picked him up and carried him to the highway, where he later was picked up by some young folks out joyriding, really. And they offered to take him to a hospital. He said, but you need to understand if, if any, any police come by and pull us over, uh, we do have guns in the car, and so it could get dangerous. 
Well, he had no choice. He said he'd go. And they did get stopped by cops. Uh, however, um, when they asked, what's about, you know, what about this guy in the back seat? And they said, well, he had a little too much to drink tonight and he passed out and we're taking him home. And thankfully the police said, take him home now. And of course, home turned out to be the hospital and the hospital said if he hadn't gotten there, if he'd gotten there 30 minutes later, uh, he would have been dead. But we heard some similar type stories uh, from people that were staying at the shelter while we dined with them. One of the women that was there, she actually has a visa to, to go to the United States and started, she should be there now. Uh, she was gonna wait till the first of the year. She hasn't had any contact from her son for over two years. And so she's looking, trying to find uh, her son. And here was in one of the wallets, of, you know, the mom, the dad, and the daughter back in Ecuador. And there was an address uh, for this particular migrant anyway that was in New York. So now we move to a more uplifting phase of this, and that's to talk about the body of Christ at the border. This is Lily of the Valley Presbyterian Church in Agua Prieta. Uh, as I said earlier, this is, this is where we stayed. They had some rooms just off of their fellowship hall. They had some rooms uh, with some bunk beds that we bunked into. <laughs> Uh, and that's where we stayed for the week. This is their sanctuary. And this is their practice. Um, if it's your birthday this week, or it was last week and you weren't in church then, um, you have to come to the front of the sanctuary so that everyone can wish you happy birthday. And by wishing you happy birthday, everyone in the congregation comes up and gives you a hug. And there are no exceptions. <laughs> everyone literally gets up and goes up and gives you. And we just happen to have uh, uh, Marcia there in the, in the center, left center, Marcia from the church in Anthony and Bill Kim, who's a pastor up in Jefferson. Uh, they both were having birthdays or was close to their birthday and so they had they went up and everybody came and gave them a hug it was it was just a wonderful experience and it reminds us that there is no longer Jew or Greek there is no longer slave or free there is no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus from Galatians 3:28 So, Frontera de Cristo, as part of the Body of Christ at the Border, partnered with a number of different agencies and nonprofits uh, in the area, both on both sides of the border. And I'm going to talk about a few of them, but. This is the Migrant Resource Center, which is the first non-governmental building that you will see if you have been, been deported and you're coming from the U.S. side back into Mexico. And this is a joint project with the local Catholic Church where they migrants can stop, get some food, get some water, make plans for where they're going next. And most of them are going back to where they came from in Mexico. And so they basically helps them get ready to, to go on the next phase of their journey. Um, at the, this is the, um, 
entity that we visited for dinner that night when I was talking about Bento. Uh, this is another shelter for migrants. Now, here's gonna be a real success story. This is Cafe Justo. Back in the late 90s, uh, Mark Adams, the mission co-worker, met Daniel Sefuentes at the Presbyterian Church. And they, were, they had a conversation about what was going on in southern Mexico and about um, the plight of the coffee farmers. And I don't know, I really haven't talked to Mike about this. <laughs> So I, I don't know how similar it, it might be to the, to the coffee situation in, in El Salvador, but I suspect it might be. But anyway, and so Mark went down to, the, to Chavez, which is in Southern Mexico, to talk to the farmers about developing a coffee cooperative. Because otherwise, those farmers and those farm workers were leaving southern Mexico, heading north, and in most cases not finding any employment until they cross the border into the U.S. The PCUSA, to which we are part of and, and we give mission money to, uh, provided a $20,000 grant to get the cooperative started. Today it's totally a farmer-owned coffee uh, cooperative. The members of that cooperative are paid roughly three times what growers are typically paid by standard commercial operations. And these are all small operations, not, not the big ones, not the big Folgers and whatnot. And there are now 40 families that are in that co-op started out with two employees and now they have five full-time employees and uh, plus eight full-time employees that work in Cafe Justo y Mas, which is a coffee shop right across the street from the Presbyterian Church where we were staying. Made that very handy. Uh, oops, wrong button again, David. And cooperative basically provides free coffee to any of the organizations that they are connected to uh, as part of doing God's call to love mercy and to, to do justice. And so any of the organizations that are working together, um, they provide the free, they provide free coffee to them. Um, Capsic is another place we, uh, these are the people that actually took us out into the desert uh, to the wall and it's actually a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center that's doing work there. Um, our, our lead coyote that day was a former bad coyote, not a good coyote, let's put it that way, uh, who also had a drug problem and that's, that's why he still um, works with Capsic to do those types of trips. Um, there's a picture of their facility with us. And now you, while we were there and hearing the story at that, at their facility, uh, we had the opportunity to help make tamales. Um, actually, this picture, I'm at the other end of the table taking a picture. <laughs> but there I am. So um, I actually got to help make tamales. And these tamales went from there to a refrigerator to this Catholic church in Douglas. Um, this, is, this is a uh, temporary shelter for migrants that have come into the U.S., have been processed, have a court date, and are 
eligible to be released into the United States. Uh, this is, if I, I apologize for digressing, but uh, this is not what normally goes on in this particular room at this Catholic church. The reason that this temporary shelter is set up there right now is because there's a there's a place where there are four churches basically on the same block in Douglas Prieta. And on one side um, is the Presbyterian Church of Douglas, as well as an Episcopal Church. And um, last May, someone um, started a fire in the sanctuary of both the Presbyterian Church and the Episcopal Church. Um, a hate crime don't know so much if it was because they are both sanctuaries for migrants or if it was the gay pastor serving the Episcopal Church but in any event both of those churches uh, experienced uh, significant damage the Episcopal Church has been raised and they're going to build a whole new building Presbyterian Church they think they can sort of reconstruct and put it back together but anyway, this is empty. This is in the morning. This is the day we actually left to come back home. But by evening, this was full to overflowing um, because I think they got a call from the Border Patrol. We got about 150 people we want to drop off. And so the tamales we had made a couple of days ago got served to the migrants that came that day. I apologize now if I get emotional on this section. Um, this is on the Pan American Highway in Douglas. It's about, um, we're about five blocks north of the border, walking south. Um, this is a place where each Tuesday at 5.15, there is a walk and a prayer vigil. And they have, it's, it's for um, people that have died crossing the border into Cochise County, uh, Arizona. And so at the end of the walk, uh, they pray for, for those that have been lost, for their families, they pray for an end to death in the desert. They pray for the U.S. government, for the Mexico government. Um, and what happens here is each Tuesday, uh, they bring these white crosses um, to the McDonald's parking lot. And they, they bring about 120. They have like close to 500, but they have 120. And on each cross is a name and a date if known as to when they died, a date, their birth date, if they happen to know that. Um, it's a, some of them, um, they don't know what the name is of the person that died. Uh, sometimes they're not even sure whether it was male or female. And those crosses simply say unknown. But anyway, you, you walk single file down this sidewalk towards the border and you have two or three crosses with you and as you get to the end of the line of people that are facing this way with their face to you when it's your turn you hold up one of your crosses and you call out the name and then everyone says presente and we're in the presence we're in their presence they're in our presence and um, this is another, another shot of that. And you can see in the cart, you can, you can see the crosses be, because after you run out of crosses, you get more. And after you've announced your cross, you put it down on the street and up against the curb. And then at, at the end, they're all there and then you have to backtrack and pick them all up but 
and here's what those crosses look like where they have a name or no identification. It's a very moving experience. And this is at the end where they're having the prayer vigil. Now, this has been going on every Tuesday at 515 without fail for now over 20 years. They have never missed a Tuesday. Some Arizona legislators didn't like the fact that there were groups taking water bottles out into the desert on the U.S. side of the border and leaving them in strategic places for migrants coming through. Um, and so they passed a law against it. Um, and people have actually been arrested for leaving full water bottles out in certain spots in the desert. This is the, this sign is in the front door, front yard of the offices of uh, Frontera de Cristo. So now let's go back in history again for a minute, back to back to 1994. Um, we had the U.S. adopted a a policy under the Clinton administration of prevention through deterrence, and. The idea was that if they increased the border staff and erected uh, barriers for people to get into the country, that it would dissuade them from trying to come north. Um, but then some of those same forces that I mentioned earlier, whether it was economic or poverty driven or whatever, um, people still were coming north. So the budget patrol, uh, the budget for the border patrol after the passage of the uh, reform bill in 1996 was a massive increase for the border patrol agency. The annual budget back then was about 400 million and it's now about 4.8 billion. And everybody agrees it needs to be more. Smuggling became a growing industry. Prior to 1994, maybe $50 to $100 got you an escort. By 98, it was up to 800. And as I said earlier, it's eight to 20,000 now. So eventually that policy didn't really work, which is why now, I mean, after, after it was put in place, in 1994, there were <clears throat> thought to be four and a half million undocumented persons in the US. And today there's more than 11 million. All of this goes back to the fact that most of what we've been doing is not geared towards dealing with the root causes of migration, but rather, um, you know, trying trying to deal with it at the end of the process. But. That's really the last time there was any legislation that passed Congress and was signed into law that affects the border. Since then, we we all keep talking about it. When I say we all, I, I, I mean, you know, not only the people that are <clears throat> like our mission workers, but also politicians and, and everyone else. We we talk, but nothing has been nothing has really been accomplished. Of what we 
we know since 1998, there have been you know almost 10,000, uh, 9,460 uh, people that have been found that, that that died in the desert. Um, <clears throat> raising the fence hasn't done much. Uh, as I, you can, there are ways to get around the wall or through the wall, and then also. Um, you know, it's it's increased the number of deaths from people that actually, like Bento that I was talking about, um, had that one group of joyriders not come along, uh, he he would have died uh, because he fell off the wall. The hospitals uh, are have been severely impacted, both emotionally and physically and financially. also has weighed heavy on the minds of the border patrol agents who are responsible for <clears throat> securing our borders. So how do we discern a faithful response? You know, for starters, it's things like this mission trip and trying to continue to spread the word within our own small world. Um, we learned an awful lot from what they do down there just in terms of what it really is to be a Christian and to try to <clears throat> try to do, truly do what Jesus would do or would want us to do. Um, to look at things in a different way. Um, we need to work hard to try to get eventually some kind of legislative changes that will actually affect the border. Um, you know, you stop and think about like the coffee co-op. If we spent even a fraction of the money that we're spending to build the wall and then to maintain the wall at somewhere between several million and $20 million a, a, a mile. If we spent a fraction of that on programming to help at the front end on the root causes, as the PCUSA did with a $20 million <coughs> grant, um, you know, those people in Southern Mexico, those those coffee farmers, they're not leaving. You know, they're, they're not leaving their farms anymore. They're staying because they all want to be in their homeland. Think about this for a moment. Um, when somebody asks me, um, is meeting me for the first time, either individually or is in a group or whatever, and they ask me, where are you from? Well, depending on what the group is, I'm either going to say Iowa or I'm going to say Des Moines if, if, they, if I'm talk, meeting someone who knows the U.S. Or to somebody who knows Iowa, I'm, I'm, I'm going to probably say Johnston, you know, where we live now. You talk to these people, none of them would answer that question where they're from that way. It's not, it's not where they are right now. Where they're from is from Chiapas, which is southern Mexico. And then they'll say, but I have moved here for work or I've moved somewhere for to go to school or whatever it might be. They start with where they were born and raised. And that's always the first answer to the question of where you are from. I never say, you know, I'm California, I'm from California. I mean, it sometimes comes up in conversations, but you know, I never say, you know, but we're all migrants. We've all migrated. 
at least most of us have. I migrated from California to Idaho to Arizona and to Iowa. Now I'm an Iowan by choice after 47 years or whatever, I guess, have I been in Iowa. But uh, we're all migrants. You know, the gospel calls us to, you know, to try to change laws and practices. The gospel calls us, you know, to try to end policies that aren't really affecting, that aren't dealing with the real or the root problem. There are, a, uh, Roger put on the table for you, there, there are a couple of handouts. One of them is just the cover, a picture of the cover of this book called Neighbor, Christian Encounters with Illegal Immigration by a fellow named uh, Ben Daniel, and Ben is uh, a Presbyterian minister. Uh, not surprisingly, but anyway, that I would have one from a Presbyterian minister, but anyway. Um, this is, uh, I think he wrote this in about 2010, uh, but it's still very accurate and it will describe for you uh, much about what goes on with migration and with, uh, with the border and with and migration. And then there are a few copies of uh, do's and don'ts. Um, and those are the, those are the uh, positions that there are a, a number of organizations that have combined their resources to lobby and whatnot together who all have the same general outlook on the issue of the border and how to solve the problems. And <clears throat> this just, uh, if I can get it to open up there, it, it simply, um, it talks about what would be helpful and what would not be helpful or would be harmful. Um, and, it, and it goes through and talks about several different issues and, and gives their position on that. Um, I don't know it for a fact, but I would guess that uh, based on what they saw in the bipartisan bill recently that eventually died, um, that they would have um, supported that bill, even if that bill wouldn't have been a perfect bill. We are all migrants. Let us live as brothers and sisters. 